I'm Bridget Babasat, and I will be helping to help to host this and keep it running for you. As we move through the presentation, please feel free to put into the chat box um, any questions that you might have as they come up. We do want this to be very interactive, so please definitely, you know, keep the questions coming. This is with the School of Sustainability session for the More to Explore event. These are some pictures of our very happy students, of course. We're going to be having an amazing session this morning of how COVID-19 unraveled our food system. We're very fortunate to be able to have Kathleen Merrigan give this presentation. Again, my name is Bridget and I graduated from the School of Sustainability and now I work with student services and teach some of our study abroad courses in an online course. We're going to be looking at Kuyone, the agendas, introducing myself, and then of course Kathleen. Colin is my colleague and he's on the chat box helping to make sure that your questions get answered and then we're here for you in the end with any student questions you might have. Um, sustainability itself is very important in the sense that it's a transdisciplinary program. So when we look at very current real world situations of what's happening, we look at it of how would an engineer approach this? How would a scientist? How would a biologist? How would a policy and governance worker? How would a social worker? We try to look at all these situations of how those different disciplines would look at solving a problem at a whole critical thinking approach. In the United States, only one in four adults have a job that's actually related to what they studied in college. We have found with our alumni, we're three times that number. 72% of our bachelor's degree graduates alumni are working in the, strand, in the sustainability field. And we work at solving complex problems. So we're using critical thinking of how these problems relate to the environment, the economy, and society. And it's very real world opportunities. Our students have internships with companies and research projects through Capstone, the study abroad programs. They're able to work locally in communities just to make sure that before you graduate, you have that opportunity to have real world skills and this is just a handful of the companies that have hired our graduates. So you can see the variety in there of nonprofit jobs, jobs with high tech companies, government jobs. There's a great variety and that speaks again to the point that we teach in a transdisciplinary way and we teach very current real world challenges. On the ASU rankings, we have received some amazing recognitions lately with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that the United Nations set forth. ASU itself is fifth in the world out of 766 institutions that are working to achieve these 17 Sustainable Development Goals. ASU has scored a 96.3 out of 100. And in the United States, we are number one. Only three American universities got into that top 100 and were the first, we're number one there. And these sustainable development goals are looking at all types of issues, everything from helping to uh, diminish or eliminate poverty someday, working on peace and social justice, water systems. It's just an amazing opportunity to be able to work on those goals. And there's seven different track areas for our students. You will be learning a little bit about all of these subjects in every single class. And then you choose as you become a junior senior, which of these areas is most meaningful for you and you dive into that area as a track. So there's all types of city jobs with working with architecture, designing transportation systems. Energy needs to be not only renewable, but it needs to be abundant and something affordable. If we can't afford it, we may not have it up on our rooftops. Um, water systems are so important and those of course are connected to food supply. Climate change affects all of these areas. Social transformation, of course, is understanding that you do make an impact, a powerful impact. And then with sustainable development, that's looking out towards our future. And all seven of these areas are connected to each other. So those are the majors in sustainability that um, track areas, the degree programs, there's Bachelor of Arts degrees. And you can look at international development, policy and governance, society, or that city focus with urban dynamics. And their Bachelor of Science degrees include economics and ecosystems and sustainable energy materials and technologies. And just two years ago, we launched our Bachelor of Science in Food Systems. Incredibly important that we understand with our growing population, we're heading to 9.6 billion people. We have to be able to feed people as we're losing farmlands, as cities build out, 
how can we have a good food system that can sustain us. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Kathleen Merrigan. Um, from 2009 to 2013, she served as the U.S. Deputy Secretary and Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. An amazing background. We have been able to draw from her experience, especially with, as I mentioned before, our challenges with food systems. So she's going to be able to speak to you about how we have these challenges and possible solutions ahead. So at this point, I would love to turn it over to Professor Merrigan. Thank you, Bridget. I appreciate that. Hello, everybody. I hope you're staying safe and not going too stir crazy being in the shutdown era that we're in. I've had my two college age students home with me for the last few months. Of course, as a mother, I'm enjoying that, but I know they're going crazy and it's been tough on us all. So I hope you remain safe and optimistic about the future because we certainly are at the School of Sustainability and at ASU. We believe that uh, there's opportunity for the next generation of leaders to do better than we have in the past. And we're excited to work with you if you come here. So um, I just wanna go back to Bridget's uh, notice, notice of our accolades in terms of being cited as one of the universities that has really come through on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I think part of that is, is because unlike a lot of universities, ASU has professors of practice. That's what I am. I have a PhD from MIT. I write articles like a lot of different professors across universities. But with my colleagues as professors of practice, we've had a real heavy foot in the real world. We've been in government jobs. We've been in corporate jobs. We've run small NGOs. So we bring that work experience into the classroom. Just this semester, for example, since I head up food systems, and I'll describe that in a minute, I have students working um, at a mobile slaughter research project in Maui, Hawaii. I have students working on new carbon market plans up in the state of Minnesota. I have students trying to figure out how to make USDA conservation programs more amenable to Native Americans here in Arizona who are having a hard time gaining access. And then I have a group of students working with the Organic Trade Association trying to think about what does innovation mean for organic going forward. So that real world connection between your academic studies and trying to have an impact to change things for the better is a hallmark of an ASU education. So a few words about food systems. Um, you may not be familiar with this term. It's relatively new uh, um, focus of studies. Uh, there are a lot of land grant universities across the country and they're great, especially if you wanna become a farmer or rancher. Those were set up by Congress in 1862 to help facilitate the mechanic and agricultural arts. Uh, but you're going there and you're studying soil science or you're studying um, uh, agronomy or uh, a particular production track. Food systems is a little bit different. What food systems is, is this thinking that we have to understand how everything is interconnected. Because without understanding how everything relates to everything else, you're only looking at a piece of the puzzle. And that's why I think that Bridget and her colleagues asked me to speak to you today, because when you see what's going on in the pandemic, what's going on in this world, in terms of the food system, many of us are saying, if we had a food systems lens and understanding, we might not be in the same predicaments that we are in fully at least. So this one graphic I'm showing you here is a food system and it just shows that you know, you can't just focus on consumption. You just can't focus on processing. You really need to have to understand the panoramic view of how it all relates. And then of course, as a student, and as you grow into your career, you're gonna have a specialization for sure. But that foundational understanding of the interconnectedness, interconnectedness excuse me, is very important. Next slide, please. Another way I try to describe food systems for people who are unfamiliar with this term is that old parable of the blind man and the elephant. You may have 
encountered this already in your studies. So the, the idea here is that the blind men are feeling up the elephant and then they're asked to describe what the elephant is. And if you feel the, up the trunk, that's one description, the tail another, uh, uh, the foot another, and it doesn't really add up to what the overall elephant is. So another way of just describing why we think a food systems view is important. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the pandemic, which you're all feeling uh, deeply in your lives, I'm sure in your family. And I'm sorry for anyone who's had families, uh, family members or friends that have uh, suffered from COVID-19, maybe even lost a life. This is very serious and, and we all have to be safe. I want to, in reflecting on the food system, talk about eight pandemic realities that I think uh, really need greater attention. Next slide, please. So um, the first thing that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic was a supply chain disruption. Uh, you probably went to the grocery store um, with your parents and there was that mad panic for toilet paper, but it was also for a lot of the dry goods in the supermarket, um, a lot of uh, canned goods, and all of a sudden we saw empty shelves. And part of that is because our supply chain is very separated. So there was, um, you know, there's a lot of food that goes into the supply chain that goes to big institutional food buyers like uh, Compass Foods and Aramark and Sodexo who would be serving a cafeteria, for example, at ASU. And then there was the supply chain that's going to the grocery stores. And those two are really, really separate. And when the pandemic hit, it was really hard to cross over and move food that was in one supply chain into another. Another thing that happened, and this is what this slide is really suggesting, is that there's a huge amount of food that's imported and exported from, from the United States. We are in a global food supply. And one of the things when I was visiting the U.S. Department of Agriculture in March with my students was uh, one of the administrators was really panicked about these containers that um, we ship food all around the globe with and they had been piling up in China because of the, you know, early on what was going on was emerging in China in terms of the pandemic. They weren't coming back. The empty containers weren't coming back this way and it was causing a real pile up here in the United States. Next slide, please. You've probably heard about wasted food. So how could there be all these people in these long, long lines at food banks, desperate for food, exposing themselves to others because they had to get the food, the heroic volunteers at the food bank, making sure people got this food. How could we have those long lines and yet you see on television food going to waste in the fields, um, being plowed under in some cases, being put in landfills in other cases. Well, that's because again, this uh, problem of the fragile, rigid really, um, distribution systems that weren't able to pivot. And um, that resulted here in Arizona, for example, of up to 125,000 gallons of milk being dumped by dairy farmers who really wanted to donate it. But they, because they, they worked really hard, their cows worked really hard to produce that milk for people, but they didn't have the ability and the finances to bring that milk to processing plants and get it bottled for distribution to food banks because under normal conditions, that milk would be going elsewhere. And the same thing down in Yuma County, which is what many people describe as a winter salad bowl of Arizona, uh, where a lot of our winter vegetables come from, some of that had to be plowed over in part because the workforce wasn't there coming across the border to help uh, harvest the vegetables. And in part, workers were getting sick and in part, uh, there just wasn't a buyer in the same way that there had been. So this is why we need a food systems approach to get back on my wagon here because we need to be figuring out how these things can better interact. Next slide, please. Hunger. Well, here is the food 
food bank um, line, one of many. Uh, in fact, the um, first food bank in the country, interestingly, was set up in Phoenix, Arizona. So we know a lot about food banks in our state. We have some great leaders who have um, really helped across the country understanding hunger and understanding about uh, times of crisis such as these. Um, we have seen a huge unemployment uh, in the pandemic. You know this, and if your families are suffering from this, again, I'm very, very sorry for that. Uh, when people don't have jobs, one of the first things that they are anxious about is getting access to food. So the demand on our food banks has been phenomenal. At the same time, the federal government has passed uh, some stimulus legislation that includes increases in the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, some people refer to this as food stamps which helps families in need. And they did make an innovation across the country, and that is to allow people to get home delivery of food, which makes sense in the pandemic, so not everyone is going out, particularly if you're ill, you don't wanna expose other people. Um, so it required some rejiggering of federal programming, expansion of federal programming. That first stimulus bill that Congress passed was $2 trillion with a T, uh, so uh, there's been a lot going on, but still we face significant hunger. Next slide, please. Meat processing. So you may have heard about this too, because this has been one of the headline stories on the televisions and in the newspapers. If you still read newspapers, I guess you guys read online. I still am an old lady. I like the, the paper copy that, that comes to my door every day. Anyhow, um, huge illnesses across uh, people who work in the processing plant where meat is slaughtered and butchered and packaged to be delivered to your grocery store. Here you see a person looking at a pretty empty meat case um, in, uh, in the grocery store. I mean, some of that early on empty cases was really about that distribution problem I talked about. Um, but we're going to see more of this because some of the um, the milk, uh, the meat that was in the pipeline and in storage is starting to run out and we still see a lot of meat processing plants closed. They're very large um, and they do huge volumes in one place. So farmers, poor farmers who've worked so hard to raise their animals have been in a situation where they can't get the animals to, uh, to the slaughter facility. And so they've actually had to euthanize them. Um, and this is just heartbreaking and at so many levels. And one of the things that some of us have talked about for years, and I'm working on a project now, is to have more small scale, multi-species slaughter facilities that are more localized that can help small and mid-sized farmers um, put together sustainable farming operations that have a reintegration of crop and livestock. And um, there's great opportunity now. So maybe with all this stimulus bill, if we put the right minds together and build the right kind of case for these sort of things, it might happen. I'm actually working on a project now trying to figure out ways to site some uh, small-scale slaughter facilities on uh, Native American land and make it a economic job opportunity and revenue stream for tribes. Next slide, please. Restaurants, okay. So um, the restaurant industry, we don't even know what it looks like in the future. I mean, now restaurants are opening, but a lot of places are saying, okay, at 50% capacity. So these restaurants who've been waiting a long time to open up now are trying to clear out half of their tables. And the margins on most restaurants for profitability is not great. And they just don't know how they're going to staff it when um, there's so few tables. So I don't know what the future brings here because more and more Americans have been eating their meals outside of the home. And it's not just white tablecloth restaurants we're talking about. We're talking about um, all kinds of uh, restaurants, whether it's a Chipotle or a Chick-fil-A 
or you know, uh, a small independent family-owned Italian restaurant, they're all hurting. And while the stimulus bill also provided aid to restaurants in terms of helping them pay their workers, in the long run, the expectation is a lot of these restaurants will never reopen. And the question is, how will that impact how we, what we, already we're seeing a lot more home cooking. Some people are rediscovering cooking in this pandemic, which can be a good thing. Um, but a lot of the restaurants, interestingly, were buying the more diverse food crops. So uh, restaurateurs are trying to distinguish their cuisine from another restaurant. And now the farmers are going back to planting basic crops like a broccoli and a carrot, which a home cook knows what to do with, as opposed to uh, other crops, maybe a bok choy or a, a bitter melon, which uh, is unfamiliar. So it is having a ripple back effect all the way to the farms. Next slide, please. So small farms I'm particularly concerned about. This has been my life's work to support small farms and to support a relocalization of our food system. You know, that buy local thing you hear about, I'm a big believer in it. And what I'm really interested in this slide is these are two headlines that are basically going back to back. One suggests that these small farms are thriving because they have relationships with their customers and so they're hitting the big payday. And then uh, Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture up in Hudson, New York, and I'm on their board of directors, they did a survey of small farms and they found quite the opposite. And they did the survey because this was the, the headline that they were doing so well. And they found that uh, two, a third of um, farmers are expecting to go bankrupt by the end of this calendar year. So not only am I concerned about the loss of those local proprietors, those farms, uh, the ability to build that local food system, but there's all that farmland at risk. You know, what is the future at a time time when we need to be attracting new young farmers to Americans, America's working lands, as we like to call them, because the aging of the American farmer and rancher, we're seeing a collapse of these small and mid-sized farms where people get their foot in the door into the enterprise of agriculture. Next, farm, uh, next slide, please. And what we're seeing across um, the food space, and this is not just food, this is across everything really, is growing inequality. So we know that sustainability, we like to say sustainability has three E's, economics, environment, and equity. And you need to be um, really good in all three things, and you have to do all three things at the same time. We, sometimes we describe it as a stool, and if you have uneven legs, then it's a wobbly stool. We want a stable stool. So I'm very focused on the E, uh, equity in sustainability. And right now we see that um, the problems of racial justice, as you're seeing across the country, uh, issues of social equity are really front and center. And there's this reawakening now that we need to do better. I know in my classes this fall, the first couple of weeks, I've uh, changed out all the readings just to deal with this issue and what's been going on across the country uh, in the wake of, of George Lloyd's death and other um, incidents, it just has to happen. And so that is a focus of our work. Worker protections. This actually follows on to the issue of um, equity because we see people uh, in the lower paid jobs um, facing the toughest circumstances. So this uh, is a slide, you see a picture of people in a meatpacking plant that we talked about, working elbow to elbow as is described, um, cold, uh, it's always cold in there. I've been to a lot of these slaughter facilities. I've probably been to over a thousand farms and ranches across the world. So. I've seen all of this. Um, these are tough jobs and we're seeing a huge um, illness factor of COVID-19 across these workers. I don't think we understand all the reasons why yet. We also see a lot of the restaurant workers, tipped workers, you know, in a lot of states, you only have to make $2 and 
maybe it's 35 cents, but $2 and a little an hour. And then the tips are supposed to make, um, make it up to minimum wage. But there are a huge number of people who are very, very vulnerable. And they don't have the kind of workplace accommodations that allow them to take sick time. And they don't have necessarily the benefits to go see a doctor. And so it just perpetrates this, this virus that we need to be. So we're really interested in what's going on in uh, the workforce around food. Next slide, please. Global food system, just FYI, um, we're starting to see huge, uh, huge um, increase in COVID-19 in Latin America, and we know that it's going across the world. And so hopefully, um, We'll be talking about food systems, just not in the American context, but globally. The last thing I really want to say, and why we want you to come to ASU, is as um, Governor Cuomo of New York um, was saying in his daily briefings on COVID-19, we don't want to just get back to where we were, we want to build it back better. And that's where we need your ideas and your energy. Next slide, please. And that's my goal and the goal of my colleagues at the School of Sustainability, and that is to educate the next generation of leaders. I hope you join us. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Kathleen. This has been so amazing. Um, if anyone hasn't had a chance yet to ask a question in the chat box, we do have these opportunities to reach out to us later. Um, you can, of course, call in, but just shoot an email to us would be great, and we can get that answer for you. This has been such an amazing presentation, Kathleen. I was hearing li little bits and pieces about it in the news and you brought it all together so beautifully and so relevantly of how this affects us and what we can actually do to help move forward with this. Anyone else on the call that needs to connect with us, please do so. We have other sessions coming up for more to explore. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are sessions that'll be coming up uh, today, tomorrow and Thursday. We're very fortunate that you can tell your friends about um, how you know, these opportunities are so relevant in the world today. And we will have this uh, beautiful presentation again tomorrow morning at 11.30. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and your attention. Um, it's been amazing and uh, Dr. Merrigan, we're so happy that you were able to join us. We feel so fortunate that you've been able to be here for us.